All right. Well, welcome everyone to our Patreon interview for Monday, September 25th, 2023. Our guest today is Dr. Colin Gorey, who is going to be talking to us a little bit about teaching ancient languages online and particularly how that is uh, being done with the Ancient Languages Institute. So why don't you start off by telling us a little bit about yourself, right? What's your background? How did you come to this? Uh, what are you doing these days with uh, ancient languages and, and what ancient languages are they? start this video by thanking my Patreon supporters who help make it possible for me to make a living teaching the subjects of my expertise in the world's most beautiful places. And uh, to everyone who buys my books, thank you so much. Okay, well, thank you. It's such a, a pleasure to be here and to be able to talk to everyone. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. So my background is, uh, I sort of came up from the world of academic linguistics um on the theoretical side i always as a, a very young <laughs> a very young budding linguist i was always interested in in uh, historical linguistics most of all but uh, uh, i was dissuaded by uh, by chance and uh, the circumstances of where i went to school um away from the historical side and more towards the theoretical side and then only after i went through my training um in linguistic theory did i find myself able to come back, uh, come back and study uh, and study the kinds of languages that first captured my attention, which were the ancient ones. And so I ended up trying to apply the knowledge I got in linguistics to um, to pedagogy and to the practice of of learning ancient languages. Okay. And what were those ancient languages that first drew you in? I mean, you mentioned Historical linguistics is an interest. Was it more the uh, sort of the big picture, or were there particular languages that drew you? Well, when I started out, I had uh, I had a big set of encyclopedias in the house, and I'm talking about very young. And I just uh, I decided I'd open it up to the first page and read it like any other book. And I saw there was an article on the letter A and where the mm -hmm. letter A came from, and I learned that it the letter a had come through through greek phoenician uh, egyptian hieroglyphs and i thought okay check 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 i've got to learn all of these and uh, my my history after that's just been an attempt to make good on that promise to myself so i got interested um the first the thing that the language that first came into my orbit was latin um but then um sanskrit um old english uh, classical chinese I'm not saying I'm particularly good and uh, equally good in all of them, but these are ones that I've sort of made a, an attempt to study at some point or to investigate how best to learn and to teach. And were these uh, were these old Britannicas or what kind of? Like yeah, they were old Britannicas. Okay. The classic, yeah. you know, I'm sure there was a, my parents had a door-to-door -door salesman show up and yeah. saddle them with this gigantic, uh, gigantic bookcase, but I benefited from it. I've still got my grandparents. Britannicas from the 60s and uh, I kind of treasure them I mean they're it's amazing how in-depth some of those articles are and in fact my laptop is sitting right now on their encyclopedia case so you know uh I my that's a heart-to-heart -heart moment there yeah. um so tell us a little bit about the ancient language institute how you came to be involved with that and what you're doing there Mm -hmm. Yeah. So with the uh, with the Ancient Language Institute, I'm really happy that I get to have something in my life that I just call the Institute. I think I'm the only one who does this, but uh, you know, over at the Institute, um, what we what we're doing is trying to incorporate the the, the findings of sort of modern second la second language acquisition research into the teaching of ancient languages. And so, it's um, the the tagline is teaching ancient languages as if they were modern languages. But ironically, 
I don't even think most modern languages get taught um, in exactly the way that if we followed the the research, what it would lead us to uh, to do. Um, so we have a, a, a kind of an interesting way of teaching, which is um, we try and maximize the amount of uh, of the language that you encounter uh, in in the course of your week. So the class comes in. I teach two. I teach Latin and Old English um, with uh, Ancient Language Institute. And what happens is we we center each class around a reading, and the readings are carefully constructed to gradually lead you into the language, um, introducing, dripping out little bits of vocabulary every week. Uh, in the case of Latin, there's a whole progression of grammar as well. Uh, in the case of Old English, um, that's the that book I wrote, so I have a slightly different uh, way of going about it. And we can talk into you know about the details uh, probably later, but. The idea is how much of the your week can you spend in this language? How much, and that, that's reading, that's speaking, that's uh, listening. If you can maximize that amount, then before too long, you will you will know the language. It's just a matter of time. It's a matter of keeping that that exposure consistent and getting to uh, you know just sticking with it for enough weeks, months, years in order to get to your goal. Mm -hmm. And could you? I guess it's just occurred to me. I mean, because I've I've sat in some on, uh, well, essentially a version of your old English class where you're teaching Luke Ranieri. Mm -hmm. um, or is that a secret? I don't know if it's that's not a secret. That's not a okay. secret. At least it just not, occurred not, to me, like not as far as I'm concerned. I don't know if Luke wants to keep that on the download, but <laughs> I don't know. It just occurred to me that maybe this is you know Ranieri's like linguistic Manhattan project that he's you know, picking up old English on the side. But um, so I've sat in on, on a little bit of that. I, I've seen uh, this method in practice and it's surprising, I think, and surprisingly effective. Um, of course, I'm watching you work with a student who's extremely motivated, but then I think part of the Ancient Language Institute's uh, special distinction is that students do come into it pretty highly motivated, right? I mean, they're there to learn an ancient language. It's not just something you're doing um, as an accessory to some other degree program or something. Most of the was... time, although there are some programs that require you to have, say, ancient Greek or biblical Hebrew or, or Latin. Uh, none yeah, that sure. I know of that require Old English yet. <laughs> but um, no, I don't know but of any. Generally, it's not someone who's doing it because they, they're being dragged into it. Right, right. Yeah, actually, that you're, you're right that, of course, like some seminaries might require some of the class volumes. Yeah, that's true. Uh, and the and ALI actually does offer some instruction that counts for credit with some degree programs, right? Like that's at right. least in Latin, isn't that right? Yeah. Yep. Latin, that's pretty um, cool. Ancient Greek, I believe as well. And that's using the uh, lingua Latina set, isn't that right? Yeah. So the Latin class of the Latin curriculum, um, well, we, ha we teach uh, kids courses as well, but um, the adult curriculum is based around Lingua Latina per se illustrata, um, which I think probably some of some of uh, your your viewers probably already know. It's a it's a a Latin textbook that it's it's really more of a reader than a textbook, in that it goes through and develops a story over the course of the book, gradually increasing the the amount of vocabulary it exposes you to, and also teaching you in a rather ingenious way a lot about the grammar of the language. Yeah, and anyone who has ever listened to Luke Ranieri talk for more than the length of like one red light uh, has heard about Lingua Latina. Uh, he's uh, he's a huge promoter of it. Um, and of course, he gave me a copy of it when he visited here a year and a half ago, and I've worked my way through it and been pretty impressed with it. And now your own textbook that you use in Old English is uh, inspired by it. I won't say based on it because you have your own story and your own twist to it but but inspired by lingua latina i would say is a fair statement so right yes it was definitely the it was definitely the catalyst um once i saw how how well it worked as a teacher i didn't learn latin based on this i learned latin you know <laughs> when i was in high school and we didn't have uh or at least even though the book was around we didn't use it and so i used a pretty traditional uh my, or my teacher used a pretty traditional grammar translation method uh which is if you've 
learned an ancient language, you've probably been exposed to this kind of pedagogy where you'll, you'll open up the chapter of the book, there'll be a, a chart of some sort or a little bit of uh, explicit grammar instruction, then a few sentences which you're supposed to translate. Uh, you might translate from English to Latin or Latin to English, um, and then a, you know, a chunk of vocabulary to learn for that chapter, and then that's that. And sort of the idea is by explicitly teaching the grammar, you're going to be able to learn it like you would um, you know, biology or something like that. You pick up the book, open it, get the facts in, you're good, you move on. But what we find is that that doesn't actually appear to be what's going on when we're acquiring languages. It's not a collection of facts that we can explicitly get into our heads just by reading them. Something else has to happen. And I mean, would you be willing to show like a little bit of this, like a demonstration of what it looks like a little bit in one of these classes? I mean, your your book is proprietary, but maybe you could show it with like some lingua latina or like a... I can definitely show some, some, some of the old book. English. Okay. All right. Yeah, yeah. If you're willing. I mean, it's uh, it's still something you're you're considering publishing eventually, right? Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. I mean, I want to be I want to be sensitive about your your IP here. Um, and Lingua Latina is published by a little publishing company called Hackett, which, uh, of course, I have a, a friendly relationship with. <laughs> so, I wouldn't feel too bad about. Uh, showing a sample of that would probably only help them. But yeah, if you're if you're willing to show us something, I think it should be great and maybe uh, mm -hmm. kind of act like we're your students for a moment. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'd love to. I'll make sure I'll make sure you're co-host so that you can uh, screen share if you'd like. Sure. Let's bring this up. So. Also, I really like your Zoom setup here. I mean, <laughs> I feel like I've walked you. into, you know, like a really competent you know, specialist doctor's office. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're about to get diagnosed with something. You're just not sure what you <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Right. But he's going to really kindly reassure me that, you know, treatment options are available and, um, and will not bankrupt me for life. So, well, this is, uh, um, th this is the latest in uh, a very many long iterations of uh, trying to get a video background uh, working. So <laughs> you're seeing the version 10. Version one wasn't quite so uh, <laughs> quite so polished. Yeah, well, I mean, my own has, has developed as my own like wall and furniture situation has changed. I have a couch now. Uh, oh, you stuff. usually have the best, you know, we, we can't complete Pete with your video backgrounds. Well, but I can't do like live Zoom stuff outside, right? That's, like that's true. That's true. That would be challenging. Because as soon as I'm two minutes from here, I don't have signal. So, <laughs> uh, but, you know, maybe one day. But of course, by the time that we have Wi Fi anywhere, uh, people will just be using AI or whatever to make it look like they're in the places I'm in. So, oh, well. indeed. Well, let me get this. Uh, here's the book. This is the first chapter here. So I'll give you a little bit. In, does this come through the, the screen yep. share all right? I see. Um, it. All right. So basically the, and we can talk a little bit, I think, after about why, the, the, the reason behind all of this. But basically the goal is to keep as much time in the target language as possible. Um, so that's why instead of having explanations of grammar and um, sentences to translate, you just have a story. And we read the story together. So this is what a typical class would start. Like, ah, uh, mine friend, mine friend, willkomme, willkomme. My friends, welcome. At the very start, we can't guarantee that anyone actually knows any of the language, so we have to do a little bit of sub verbal subtitling. Mm -hmm. Mine friend, willkomme. Mine. Friend, my friends, willkomme, willkomme, welcome. Uton, uton radon at gadere, uton radon at gadere. Let's read together. Uton radon. And uton radon be Oswalde be Oswalde beran. Oswald bera. Wa. What is Oswald better? Oswald better. Mm, Oswald is better. 
Rar. Oswald is better. West to Hall, Oswald. West to Hall. West to Hall. Hello. West to Hall, Oswald. On the Oswald side. Where's that here, Harley? Where's that here, Harley? Hello, everyone. On the mini friend, Uton Radon. Uton Radon. Mildrith. Mildrith on the Hire Fader. Hmm. Mildrith on the Hire Fader. Mine friend, there is on Englalonde Little Toon. Hmm. Little Toon, Evne. Little Toon. This is Little Toon. And. And. On them Toon is Little Hoos. Little Hoos. Ah, and on them Hoos is Little Maeth. Little Maeth. Evne, mine friend. Little Maeth. West to Hall, Maeth. Hell is Mildrith. Ah. Mildrith. Hell is Mildrith. Mildrith is here uh, Nama. Mildrith is here Nama. Evne. Mean. Nama is Mildrith. Mildrith. Here is Mildrith. Mildrith wunoth on whose? Ah, where wunoth Mildrith? Here wunoth on whose? Evne. Evne. Mildrith hus. Mildrith hus. Here wunoth. Mildrith. Her wunoth Mildrith. Each wunie on whose? Each wunie on whose? Jackson, thu? Par wunas tu? Wunas tu on whose? Othe on holte? On holte. Par wunie each? So lege. Each. <laughs> Each one here on uh, Litlum Huse. Oh, so liche, so liche, indeed. On Litlum Huse. Ah, so liche. Mildrith wunath ak on Litlum Huse. And ah, Elles hua wunath thar. Here fader. Here fader wunath ak thar. So liche. Evne. Mildrith. Mildrith is. Little mouth and Evne here a father. So dice Mildred the father would not act on little um huse. Mm. God and Mildred will a star ye hero. Hmm. Mildred will a star ye hero. What is star? Eh, Winnie the Pooh is a star. Paddington Bear is a star. Harry Potter is a star. Hisindon star. Mildrith wille. Mm. Ah, each wille star ye hiron. Mildrith wille. Wille. He wille star ye hiron. On the Mildrith quath. Fader. Each wille star ye hiron. Mm. What wille Mildrith? He wille. Star ye hiron. Hmm, star. And here father. Oh, it's ye tell le star. Oh. What ye telleth? Mildred the father? He ye telleth star. Och, what star ye telleth Mildred the father? Ah, here father ye telleth Mitchell. Mitchell star. Mitchell star. His name is Oswald Bera. Ah, Oswald. Oswald. Evne, mini friend. Oswald. Oswald is Bera. Evne. Bera. And his name is Oswald. And that star, that star is Ak 
Oswald Berra. The status Nama is Oswald Berra. Hmm. On the this is that star. Ooh. Get out of character for a moment there. So basically, what we're trying to do is take the text and kind of dance around it a bit with these questions, with pictures, with all sorts of things that we use to sort of scaffold up your comprehension of it. So I'm hoping that that you know old English is not so distant from modern English that we we don't we're not going in with a little bit of something. Um, but with these questions, you know, what is he doing? What does she want? Where does she live? Who is this? We can start to scaffold up understanding and reach the point of comprehensibility. Comprehensibility does not mean that you understand everything. It doesn't mean you understand all of the grammar. It doesn't mean you understand every little bit of every nuance of vocabulary, but it means that you know what's going on and you're sort of participating with the story as a listener. And then, uh, and asking questions in the target language and getting uh, learners to actually produce a little bit, right? Even if it's just mm -hmm. kind of mirroring the text that they see, right? Turning a question into a statement. Or, or exactly. So this is this is how it starts. Get It gives people an easy way to start speaking the language. And when we think about... When we think about what drives acquisition of a language, and I'm using acquisition rather than learning um, for a specific reason, which is that acquisition of a language, the uh, the building up of knowledge of a language within you is different from the way that we learn other things. And so that is sort of typically why it's talked about in terms of acquisition rather than learning. Although casually people will say language learning. Uh, it's because the the speaking is an effect of acquisition. It's not a cause. So we aren't actually needing to speak right away, but speaking has a really, really great benefit, which is that it laser focuses you on the material. And when I ask a question to someone in Old English and they answer, we're communicating. We're communicating about something that we both are attending to in the moment. And this is, seems to have a, an almost... Um, magical effect of honing your attention and telling your mind, this is something worth paying attention to. This is something worth teasing out the patterns of so that we can build up that model of the language in our minds. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I've, I've, it's been so neat just from what I've seen of you and, and, and Ronnie Gary going through this text. And by the way, folks, you are seeing a preview of pretty much exactly how the old English class starts, right? Yep. It is just starting with reading through the story of military that's her dad to tell her story and then we start getting the story of Oswald the Bear. <laughs> um, and it's been kind of surprising to me, um, you know, one thing that I think is, is really, really different from that classic way of teaching ancient languages is that you're not just foregrounding grammar with tables and stuff which is so much of what winds up chasing people away um, early on in, in traditional classrooms and something like Old English or Old Norse or Latin or, or, or Russian. You know, it's, it's true of living languages with this kind of grammar too. Um, you know, you're not just, you're not putting charts in front of people. You're kind of trusting that people will, uh, I mean, you, you, you explain this better than I do, but I, it just really strikes me that, that, that you're not, doing it that way. Can you explain how you, you see students acquire that grammar anyway? Mm -hmm. Well, it's it's important to to mention that no Old English speaker ever saw a chart of right. anything right. about Old English grammar. Um, it, this is something that we, um, we use as an analytical tool. We can, I mean, the charts don't lie. They do, they do describe real patterns. So there's nothing wrong with them. But the, the way in which language. And I'm, I'm going to try and define language here in a sort of operational way, which is the tacit knowledge of how the language's grammar works. That's what we're really acquiring. We have to build that up within our ourselves. So each one of us who speaks uh, any given language, say in, in my case, uh, English right now, the my ability to speak English and to comprehend what you're saying to me and to be able to read what people are um, writing in and, and understand it, all of that ability is based is 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 a very tacit kind of knowledge. It's not anywhere explicitly in um, in my mind. It's right. something that you know we all know that we have to learn 
the grammar of our own language in an explicit sense. Like we need to know that that him is the the form that we use when he is the object of a verb or a direct of a, object of a verb or of a preposition. We need to learn these concepts: direct object, preposition, um, pronoun, which are not given. Nevertheless, we have all this kind of linguistic behavior that assumes that we do know what those things are because we make the patterns work in our own speech. So the ability that allows me to do that is is this sort of tacit knowledge of the language. So the way that tacit knowledge of the language is built up is through exposure to uh, what's called input. That is um, sort of language coming in. So whether it's read, whether it's heard, um, whether it's seen in some way, um, this language is coming in, but the crucial bit is that the input needs to be comprehensible. This is the the term that's usually um, put together, comprehensible input. You'll even see people write it as CI because it's so crucial that they write it so often that they need to abbreviate it. And mm -hmm. comprehensible input is just sort of language coming in that you understand. And so this is what builds up the um, the linguistic system, that, inter that uh, tacit internal knowledge of language that we have for first language speakers and for second language speakers. There isn't a huge difference between the two in this regard. So all of that is like, a, I, I'll often um, analogize it to a, a plant that is growing with the the water and the sunshine of, of input. Then what happens later is you can then start to become explicit about what you know, but it's not necessary. Uh, we know all the speakers of, you know, I won't say all, but virtually all the speakers of um, of ancient languages that we're talking about did not have a an explicit model of what was going on. We don't have a lot of grammarians, you know, pondering why why does this work this way? You say this, not that. There are in some languages a few, but it's overwhelmingly not the case. And yet every you know every random person on the street spoke grammatical. Old English or Latin or ancient Greek or whatever. Um, so if they can do it without the charts, we can do it without the charts. And uh, and what we see is given enough um, given enough input, we start to see people producing the forms that we would expect if they had grown up in that in that milieu. It just mm -hmm. takes a long time in terms of how many hours of input are they getting. When we think about children. We think we often say, "Oh, children can can learn a language effortlessly." You know, it's happened so quickly. But when you think about how many hours they're spending absorbing that language, right, I don't know right. if I would call it quick. Uh, and then, if we fast forward to adulthood, do we have you know thousands and thousands of hours to be spending on? You know, we have lives. <laughs> we need right. to do other things with our time. So we often think, "Oh, it's very frustrating that I'm not making progress in this language." But then, when you think you ask yourself how many hours I've actually spent absorbing that language, getting input. It's often not very many. Right. Well, and I mean, all of this, it, it, this, this, you know, brings up several questions and remarks, some of which we've, we've talked about privately, but um, one, one thing it really highlights to me is the question of what is the, what does it mean to have acquired an ancient language. And I think often our traditional classrooms, the, the target model is that the student will eventually become the person who can write the textbook, right? Who can, who can reproduce all the charts and who can reproduce a lot of the glossary from memory, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But it strikes me that the ALI method, your method here, defines what it means to have acquired that ancient language, not as being able to reproduce the textbook, but much more as being able to look at a text and read it as you would read a modern language text. Yes. Right. Yes, exactly. Exactly. It's, um, it's an ability to participate in the language mm -hmm. as a reader, perhaps as a writer as well, not necessarily always, but, uh, you know, the people have different interests in this regard, but, um, at the very least, to be able to pick up a text in, you know, a text in Latin and just read it. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, for a long time, people have even even teachers have denied that this is possible. 
Um, but it's not impossible because, you know, you can see people do it. Um, and it just requires a different kind of instruction. Uh, there's a common um, refrain, a common sort of lament of students of, of Latin and many other languages, but Latin's the one that I hear most about, where people say, I've studied Latin for four years and, you know, I think I can get through 10 lines of Virgil in an hour. And that is not what I would call having acquired the language. Typically that happens because you've got a very good explicit knowledge of the language. We could say that you know a lot about the language, but you don't know the language. Mm -hmm. And it, it's not the kind of knowledge that allows you to look at a sentence and have the meaning sort of immediately suggest itself to you. When we think about, uh, I mean, it's kind of interesting to think about it, but language is sort of an illusion in the sense that you look at letters on a page or pixels on a screen, or you hear certain sounds coming into your ears and meaning suggests itself to you. But the meaning is obviously not inherent in those things. It's right. kind of like an optical illusion. It's an illusion based on the fact that you have this knowledge of the language in your mind and you're able to, um, in fact, you're not just able, you're compelled to understand what you see and hear, which is very interesting. And it's, it's, it's very hard to step back from that. Part of linguistic training is stepping back from language and looking at the form without immediately just proceeding to the meaning and being reflective about it. Um, but that's not the norm. And what we get when we do the, when we use the, this, I, I won't say traditional, the more 20th century um, approaches to teaching languages is we get people who are very good at knowing about the language. They know many facts. They can reproduce the charts. They can write the glossaries, as you were saying. But um, that illusion escapes them. And so wow. when they go to read, their process of reading is not like the process they would uh, take in reading a, a book in their first language. It's, you know, it's something where they have to clear off a desk and get, you know, a dictionary out over here, get a big piece of paper yep. out here, you know, writing writing little translations of each line that, you know, that's not how I read English. That's not how I read any language, but that seems to be how, um, how people assume that, that ancient languages should be read, but there's no reason why that should be the case. Well, and there's a lot of gatekeeping about those very methods. Uh, you know, I know of zero people teaching ancient languages in classrooms in universities in a method like this. Um, I got to some advanced classes in one language or another where you would do reading of this kind or you would, re you would do more spontaneous reading, but um, students still often were expected to prepare translations of it. They weren't reading necessarily right off the page. Um, you know, I, I took baby steps toward a method like this in, in the sense that from the very first time that I was teaching Old Norse at UCLA, you know, five lifetimes ago, um, I had students, I told students not to prepare translations, right? I said, make take marginal notes, that's fine. Write all over the thing, but don't write me up your line by line, sentence by sentence translation, because it does not show me that you know how to read this, right? Like have have the glossary like know how to use the glossary that's great but i i don't care about your prepared translations um but there's still because of the way and we've talked about this too privately and and, and with running area because of the way that i was sort of raised in that more classical system there's still sort of that mental block you know i always have the very traditional um professor in the back of my mind or something being like you don't do this kind of thing, you know, like, um, this is too playful. It's too, <laughs> what are you having fun for? This yeah, exactly. What are you having? It seems yeah. wrong. Yeah. One thing um, I, I often, oh, sorry to interrupt you there. Uh, Jackson. No, no, no. I was just like, that's, you're actually, yeah. What are you having fun for is, 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 a, 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 a good way of putting that retort. But of course, when you get down to it, I mean, it's as an absurd a complaint as the complaint of why are you studying this in the first place? Because why do people study this stuff in the first place? Because on some level, it's fun to them, right? Mm -hmm. So like saying your fun can only be respectable if we turn it into not fun. Yep. <laughs> you know? 
<laughs> it's kind of absurd. <laughs> well, I, I I tell my students this, and and they're always delighted to hear it that with learning languages, um, the fun way is actually the effective way. Yeah. So rarely in life is this the case, but <laughs> it it happens to be the case here that reading stories, interacting with people, um, you know. And people's tolerance for interacting with others obviously varies, but a little bit of interacting with other people, a little bit of interacting with stories actually is a great way. It's the fastest way to my knowledge um, to acquire a language. And that's very strange because normally we expect to sort of sweat and furrow our brows and put in the hard work and you know then we get the reward by having suffered. But in this case, it's not it's not true at all. So I find people who have this kind of almost masochistic desire to make it hard for themselves for some to, to make them believe that that's the way it's going to work. I have to try and disabuse them of that notion. Yeah. Um, what's, what's kind of interesting is a historical side note is the, the grammar translation method, which is the, the foil that, you know, people talk about when they talk about uh, these more modern, uh, these more modern teaching techniques, the grammar translation method where you learn explicitly the grammar and then you have to go translate things to prove that you know it um in the it, it's a pr uh, product of the 19th century uh and it really gained prominence in the 20th but one of the explicit um motivations behind it in the 19th century was that it was character building oh okay hmm. it may, prepares Maybe. you you know learning to translate latin it's difficult but it's it's good for you it's good for the soul it's like building a wall you know teaches you something about manual labor so this teaches you something about mental labor um which it it you know it certainly does but uh if your goal is to you know develop character there are probably more direct ways to do it other than learning latin i think the right. better goal for learning latin is to learn latin but you know maybe right, that's controversial right. <laughs> well and and actually when you mentioned that the the effective way in learning languages is the fun way it occurs to me also you know you talk about how children spend all these hours learning the language but, but these kids aren't, you know, like the necks craned over books in the library, puffing their vape pen, you know, like they're just throwing balls at each other and saying, you know, throw me the ball or whatever. Like that's how they're learning is just, they're just having fun. And at the meanwhile, they're learning to communicate with each other. Um, so adults duplicating that as well as they can is probably pretty effective. Um, you know, to some extent, I guess some of the, uh, language learning apps that are so popular try to duplicate that. But I think that they don't do as well as something that's actually instructor driven because they don't allow you, I guess make this probably like some premium plan you could pay for some of these things, but they don't allow you to like actually just interact with somebody. Like with you reading Oswald the Bear, you know, you're going to ask me, where does Oswald live? And I'm going to say, you know, he lives in the forest. And um, maybe if I make some mistake, you'll let me know pretty quickly, but in a really low pressure way, because you're not grading it. Uh, what I said, that was a little bit wrong. You, you, you don't uh, grade, right? There's no grading except in the university equivalent classes in ALI. Yeah, you know, at, at ALI, the default is is no grading. Um, if, you know, in, in the case of certain partner institutions, there may be uh, different differences. But if you're coming to take a class, just to take a class, then then it's purely about the, the learning. Yeah. Well, and that makes sense because, of course, you know, I think a lot of these more traditional teaching methods, as well as grading, uh, a lot of the basis of that is just what can we credentialize, right? And it's sort of hard to credentialize just, well, we had fun for a few hours. like yeah. Because the, the purpose of that is not creating a credential. The purpose of that is creating a skill, which is pretty hard to evaluate. Um when you don't have a really active speaking community for a language. Mm -hmm. and Not to mention grading sucks. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's more, you know, teacher, the teachers have sort of a certain number of hours to spend um, teaching. And wouldn't it be better to take that extra time preparing more materials, you know, talking, interacting, taking on more classes, you know, talking with students, helping them through, um, helping them through texts, things like that, rather than grading them. Um, it just seems like a more effective use of time to actually do the teaching rather than do this meta work around the teaching. 
one hundred percent. It isn't strictly speaking necessary. No, I, I I like that a lot. Um, I mean, I, I I find this a really uh, just engaging and fun and cool way to do it, and I am uh, pleasantly surprised at the uh, the success that ALI is having with its Latin, Greek, Old English, Hebrew right now, right? That's right. Four languages. Yeah. Um, why don't we see if anybody in the comments has some questions for you, uh, whether about ALI or Old English or Latin or language learning in general? Take any of any anything from there. Um, while so we're, said, oh, sorry, I was going to say while we're waiting, I was going to pick up on one thing that you said, Jackson, which was uh, the uh, that the apps lack that interpersonal aspect. And it seems very hard for us to trick ourselves into thinking that we're communicating when we're not. Oh, yeah. It's like these role playing exercises they use in some modern language classes, you know, let's go to the post office and, you know, you will be the post, the, the person behind the counter and you'll be the person who wants to send a package and, you know, really care about this. But you can't because you're not at the post office, you're in a classroom. Right. And there's this sort of air of fiction around the whole thing. It makes it very hard to yeah. to imagine that you're communicating. Whereas it's like I'm never going to be at the post office. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but then it's also hard as an instructor, by the way, to create, to, to create an incentive structure, even in a modern language class for students to actually talk to each other in it. I mean, it's a huge pain to me, you know, when I was teaching a regional Icelandic, um, because you try to get students you know, to, to, to have conversations. And the conversation is always, you know, a variation of, hi, my name is, how are you? Or it's, why are you studying Norwegian? Which, you know, people only have so much to say about. Like, it's just hard to get people to sort of bypass that and actually just try to have normal conversations. Because then they say, well, I don't have the equipment, right? I don't know enough about this. It's like, well, use it right? Look up things as you need to, but like using it is how you get that equipment. It's really, um, it's really tough because, you know, at the same time, we want people to develop the skill of speaking. And this is separate from the knowledge of the language. You can have excellent knowledge of the language, but no, um, you have, you still have difficulty taking that knowledge and bringing it out in, in real time. So that is totally. a skill that, you know, does develop. Um, more along the lines that other skills do with practice. But uh, it's hard when people don't have anything to say. This is, yeah. you know, this is the difficulty. So you want them to be able to speak, but for that to happen, they have to have something that they want to say. And so I think the the approach that that I've taken to try and get this happening is keep the focus on the text and keep the text as interesting as possible. Because yeah. then people have opinions. So the characters in, in Oswald Beta, for example, um, I try to have them do kind of morally ambiguous things. And people get, you know, people yeah. don't know whether this person's good or bad. And so they start to say, no, you know, I he's a terrible person. Why did he do that? And then the other person in the class will say, oh, it's just because of this. It's totally justifiable. And then they'll start arguing with each other about, in Old English, about what, you know, whether this character is... Um, is good or bad or this sort of thing. So there are ways, but it takes a bit of creativity. No, I think that's great. I mean, because it, it gives everyone a common frame of reference. They're not trying to come up with what to say. I mean, you know, they all have an opinion on whether Oswald should have, you know, <laughs> should have snuffed the bridge guard or not. You know, <laughs> like, like, I, I don't know if that's what you're talking about. But <laughs> um. It's, I, I think it's a, a really fun way of doing it. I mean, Lingua Latina is kind of like that, although I think your story is a little more engaging than the Lingua Latina story with, although, you know, Lingua Latina is fine. Like, it's just all these kids kind of screwing around and like climbing trees and falling out of them and you know, <laughs> like all that it's, stuff. But, yeah. One of the things I wanted to, to do differently, I mean, I say this without meaning to besmirch, um, Lingua Latina per se illustrata. It's an excellent oh, book. It's oh. probably the best book for learning any language ever. But um, I would rather have a more intrinsically interesting story with adventure and deeds of valor and grave danger and things like this, um, which 
which that book actually does have a little bit towards the end, but uh, it's all the way at the end. And so m- some people may get halfway through the book and say, oh, this is boring and give it up. I would like to uh, to prevent that from happening. I, I, I use the principle of the cliffhanger and, and things like that to to keep people reading and, and you know, ask what's the most wacky thing that could happen in the year 1000 in England to a bear. And that, that was my sort of goal, my animating principle in, uh, in writing the, the book. Yeah. It makes sense to me. And uh, you know, it's been inspirational to me to encounter some of this. I mean, like Luke Ranieri has been working on me forever to adopt more of his, living language approach to to teaching old languages right um and you know he's very persuasive about it i've uh, been working on this old norse text for what seems like forever and it's sort of gradually incorporated more and more of these ideas and then i'm so intrigued by the way that you do this um while always having somewhat cold feet because of that professor in the back of my mind says well, I don't know if they can create a full you know subjunctive verb paradigm <laughs> but uh, what's interesting but is I bet if you went back in time to say ancient Rome and asked someone on the street to produce a full subjunctive verb paradigm they wouldn't have been able to do it yeah right because so. it's just spontaneous <laughs> yeah right. I, I see a, a, a question or a remark in the comments from Jerry um it's really driven to me that reading, writing, and speaking, hearing are two almost distinct, different cognitive skills. But the modern world provides access to a lot fewer conversational Norse speakers than, say, German or Danish. How can we fix that? That's an excellent point. Um, yeah, it's so the this is a lot easier with Latin. I'll say that because there is a tradition going back a number of decades now. Um, of using Latin as a, ling- a living language, at least in certain contexts. And so there's been a lot of work um, done to surface some of the conversational phrases that um, that we have access to. Um, and there's been this sort of body of, of knowledge that's developed. And, you know, there are conferences and um, get-togethers and YouTube videos and podcasts and things so that you can get and, that input. And weddings, right? Didn't and weddings. Just go to, did Ronnie just go to a wedding that was in Latin? <laughs> So, you know, it does happen um, with, but then it drops off quite steeply after after Latin. I mean, actually, to be yeah. honest, Sanskrit does have this as well. Yeah, sure. um, you know, ancient Greek, biblical Hebrew, and then old English, it's, you know, you're down to the point where there are very few people even making uh, old English content on YouTube, um, which, you know, that's a major source uh, that you can use for for Latin or for any modern language for for that matter. Um, and so I think the the difficulty is, you know, we have to build that up as a as a community of of teachers. And you know, Old Norse I think is probably in a similar boat to Old English um, when it comes to but, the quantity of say recorded material. And are, are there any Old Norse podcasts, Jackson? Uh, like spoken Old Norse, I don't think so. But there's kind of an asterisk with Old Norse because modern Icelandic is. you know everybody disagrees about how close to say that it is you know it's not the same thing as old norse but it's a reasonably close descendant language so like there are good materials for modern icelandic of course modern icelandic is not the biggest spoken language so it's not like there's tons of stuff like some other languages but there's some stuff and it can help you um so one thing i've debated with myself in considering whether um well, I mean, you know, uh, say that uh, rivers flow at a certain direction here and, and, and someone were to do something with ALI that we're teaching Old Norse in a method like this, should one actually do that with modern Icelandic pronunciation? Because then it allows you more access to that. The problem being that if you then, what you're really trying to do is read Old Norse, you're so complicating that task by trying to read modern Icelandic out of it. I think. Mm. So it's like, it's that access to those materials versus the, like, how complicated do I want to make the basic skill that you're trying to acquire? I don't know. Well, we can draw an analogy to how, um, how Latin and, um, 
actually, I think all of the other languages that ALI teaches other than Old English have two, um, at least two pronunciation systems that are relatively uh, commonly used. So Latin has uh, restored classical and ecclesiastical. Uh, ancient Greek has, you know, the, the um, you know, reconstructed Attic. There's the different varieties of Lucian. There are people Greek's who pronounce Greek's a good comparison. Ancient, yeah. Greek yeah they pronounce comparison. ancient Greek in modern Greek uh, pronunciation. Yeah. And with Hebrew, there's, um, there's uh, Sephardic and um, Ashkenazi Hebrew. So there are, there are different, you know, and, and then some. Um, so there are, there are different, I would say that the pronunciation is a lot less of a big deal than it seems. It starts out being hard, but very rapidly, once you get past probably the first 10 weeks or so, you start to acquire that skill, which is transposing between the different pronunciation systems. And it starts to feel like you're hearing someone from England versus from New Zealand or from the U.S. or Sure, sure. I mean, a lot of Spanish learning programs have you hearing like Spanish speakers and South American speakers and Mexican speakers like all pretty early on, just so you kind of get used to hearing some of those variations. Yeah, mm -hmm. that makes I, sense. I would say that that is actually part of the um, sort of that meta dialectal awareness is part of what you're learning, part of yeah. what you're trying to acquire. Yeah, I see what you mean. That's 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 well observed. Uh, there's another question in the comments. Uh, Robert was asking, for your approach, how much do you look at vocabulary frequency when choosing which words to use in your first chapters? Oh, I love this question. Yes. Um, I used vocabulary frequency extensively. Um, when I started writing this book, the um, there was not a lot of... Um, there were some frequency lists hanging around on the internet, but nothing that was too solid. But midway through the writing process, a um, frequency dictionary of old English prose came out uh, in sort of mid last year. And that was a great help. Um, so the, the animating principle is to tell an interesting story, but the constraint of using common vocabulary, well, part of that's taken care of just by the fact that anything you write is going to have common vocabulary in it because that's sort of just how language works. Um, sure. You know, and and he and but are going to show up more often than defenestration, sure. But um, but there's also the aspect of within the story, how do we sequence the vocabulary? Do we want the most common stuff right at the start? Um, and that I decided not to do because I wanted to tell a story about a bear. Bera is not a particularly common uh, word. I mean, it's probably in around like number 2000 or something like that. It's not in the top 500. So if I were dripping things out by vocabulary frequency on that fine grained uh, scale, I it would impede my ability to tell a story, but, um, but I do use it as an overall, an overall principle. So I, where I'm trying to say something, I will always use the most common in the, at least in Ozo Albera, I'll use the more common, uh, word, or at least I'll try to, um, it's, uh, it's a really good way that we can use technology to make the resources better. Because the goal is always to, you know, the goal of me writing Oswald Berra is Berra is not to have you read Oswald Berra. It's to have you read Old English texts. Oh, right. I, right. I what, well one of my little catchphrases that I want to say that I don't want to be the your ultimate teacher. The language itself is the ultimate teacher. I'm just making the introduction, so that you can go then into the texts and and spend time with them and and learn from them. Uh, so it's um, it's good then to use the frequent vocabulary because that makes that transition out of the pedagogical material and in, into primary texts that much easier see, because yeah. you haven't just learned a bunch of very esoteric vocabulary. Then you go into a text and wait a second, I don't know any of this stuff. Well, it strikes me that you're almost saying that the frequency list has a subtractive rather than an additive, additive role because what you're trying to do is not build the story around a particular bunch of vocabulary, which by the way, I tried to do get frustrating, but choosing between words when you already have a story you're telling and saying, well, I'm going to pick the more frequent one when there's a choice mm -hmm. like that, that makes perfect sense for what you're talking about. Yeah. Or and another way. Using... Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say another way in which I have used frequency is um, to make sure that there aren't whole domains of experience that are commonly referred to in old English literature that I don't talk about. So Makes I sense. had to talk about 
I have I have a, a whole uh, sequence in the book about um, monastic life. Actually, that makes sense. It's just those Oswald take. <laughs> take Oswald goes quotes. to a monastery, and you know, there's a yeah. He he becomes a student um, and starts to learn to read, and he starts to learn all sorts of different things there. And um, does he take because vows? <laughs> he doesn't take vows. Um, but the reason that he does that is because the if you look at the frequency list of you know in in old english minster monastery is a very very frequent word sure. you know bishop you know obviously that those aren't the most distant words from their modern english equivalents but there are there are all sorts of other things that are specific to to monastic life that are talked about a lot why because the authors of old english texts are living that life so we have to make some uh, allowances for that and so i the book also tries to take you on a journey through old English literature in that everything that they talk about a lot in the literature, I want you to have some introduction to from the book. Makes sense. Makes sense. And this is why I don't think that you can very easily transpose the story from one milieu to another, because so much of it is, is going to be culturally specific. That, I mean, what, yeah, what you're saying there makes, makes a ton of sense. Sorry, I saw a name in the comments it's, that made my my uh, my my vision go blurry for a moment. Um, um, what was I thinking? Uh, Joe asked, following on from Jerry's question, how can we implement ALI techniques if we're studying Old Norse or another language alone? It's a good question. How useful would translating things like memes or song lyrics be for this purpose? Translating from English into the target language, um, I think. Probably, so one of the the core insights um, from the sort of second language acquisition literature is that output follows output is the effect of acquisition, not the cause. So you know it's not bad to do translations into the target language, but it's not going to be the thing that drives you forward for the most part. Now it's not to say you're not going to learn some interesting things by doing so, but if you're at the point where you're still starting to get the engine going, um, that's probably not what I would recommend. Um, you also always want to avoid frustration. And if you're trying to say things that you can't quite, you don't have the model yet for, then it's uh, it's it's time to get more input rather than output. Uh, so how would we use these, how would we try and incorporate these techniques uh, into self-study? Um, well, what I do is, and you know, I've done this for, for other languages, not for Old English, um, is I try to find texts that are relatively low in their vocabulary load um, and I, if I, if possible, if I can get a sort of a facing translation or something like that, that will help. What I want to do is make that text comprehensible. So Oswald gives us a shortcut in that the text is more or less, at least if I've done it well, comprehensible going in with a little bit of, maybe a little bit of vocabulary help here and there, marginal notes and things like that. Um, if we are self-studying, we don't have access to that. So we need to make our own comprehensible material. And this is where you can do things like that I call the good kind of cheating, where if you have a translation, that is scaffolding you up to comprehension of that material. If you are an expert about the topic, that's scaffolding you up to the level of comprehension that you need for that that text. So it's uh, if you have an extreme interest in the topic and you're willing to spend 24 hours a day just staring at that text and trying to get meaning out of it, that's also a good way. Um, you know, that's probably somewhat rarer, but to create the comprehensible input material that you then yourself will then use, um, that's the sort of beneficial cycle, the virtuous cycle that uh, the virtuous, yeah, the process that will will get you there. But it's 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 a bit of a slog, I will say, and it requires a certain amount of a certain amount of uh, discipline to do. And it's. I, I was also thinking about what you were talking about um, a little bit earlier with with trying to, to to have the input that students are getting reflect the genres that they're going to be reading later. One thing that you can struggle with in self-study is actually doing that well for yourself. Because if you're trying to just pick whatever the easiest text is, 
or, or something somebody says is the easiest text, it might not be a very reflective text of what you're going to read um, elsewhere. Um, one slight advantage that Old Norse has with this is that I'm going to say, unlike Old English, some of the easiest texts are also some of the most fun, right? Because like prose sagas are often just, you know, bizarre, fun fantasy action stories. And uh, they're not particularly tough Old Norse, right? Um, whereas with Old English, the really fun stories are often going to be a little bit hard to read, you know, because Beowulf is in meter. And so it's got special concerns you have to worry about there. Uh, whereas some of the easiest stuff to read are going to be like, you know, Christian literature, which is not going to excite a ton of people. Um, so that is, that is a slight advantage that Old Norse has. Because um, mm -hmm. if you're trying to do an Oswald Bear equivalent in Old Norse, um, and think about, well, how do I make this like the stuff that people are going to be realistically reading? The stuff they're going to be realistically reading is crazy adventure fantasy stories. So that's you know, yeah, like just so... not a crazy adventure fantasy story. <laughs> Uh, exactly. So that's so that's not too bad. Um, a little bit more of a challenge, maybe if you were doing it with like Gothic, <laughs> because in Gothic it's like, well, <laughs> here is a uh, Calc Bible translation and some Bible commentary. Uh, but but Gothic's it's, not what uh, we're talking about here. Yeah, it's it's you you do have a bit of a leg up with Old Norse because of the intrinsic interest and the alignment between the interests of of the learner and the and of the sort of corpus that they'll be reading. Um, yeah. What I will say is don't always trust the judgment of um, those Victorian um, those Victorian uh, compilers of textbooks and readers. They'll say, this is easier, this is not, this is harder. Um, the thing that makes something easy or hard primarily is not grammar, it's vocabulary. Mm. You know, there's... Sure. Uh, there's just, there's only so much you can do when you only understand 50% of the words, even, you know, what they refer to at all. You can say, oh, you can go through and say something in the dative on the something with something and something. Your comprehension is basically nil. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you, even if you don't understand what's going on with the grammar, in you know, 100%, if you know that, you know, bear, sword, go forest, there are only so many options that, you know, and, and the logic of the narrative often helps you. Logic, the logic of the narrative is one of the, the biggest superpowers that you, you can get. And this is often lacking in um, a lot of the old English prose because it's not narrative. It's sort of didactic or, um, you know, it's a homily on something and it doesn't tell a story. Stories have their own logic and they're a lot easier to understand than just sort of more abstract kind of yeah. Yeah. arguments. Or or um, like Kathy mentioned in the commentary, like using, um, you know, I have, I have the Wanderers Hovmall, which has Old Norse on one side and English on the other. It's a somewhat hard text to use here in the respect that there's not one single story that goes through it. Um, on the other hand, each stanza is so self-contained, it's kind of a nice thing if you're just looking for like a quick hit. Um, when I was in my master's program, I used to do this thing uh, I just called it like my old Norse hour of power. I'm pretty sure I got that from like some radio show or something, but so I would just spend an hour just exposing myself to old Norse, regardless of whether I was understanding every single thing that I read or not. But just the exposure does you a lot of good because, you know, the next time you see a word, it's like, Oh, I remember that I ran into this word that I didn't know yet. And like, maybe you remember the context. Um, it's surprising how much it can help just to get exposure even when you don't fully understand it. it's part of why i listen to a lot of audiobooks and podcasts and languages that i'm trying to learn or maintain not because i'm understanding it 100 percent, but because as long as i'm probably as long as i'm better than 50 percent um i'm learning something just from the exposure mm -hmm. you're getting something out of it the the fact that you don't understand everything is you know, if, if you understand enough, it's almost like a, a bit of fuel for your mind to, this says, says, okay, let's gear up. We have something to do here. There's something about the world that I don't understand that is that seems important. You know, we're good at learning from those situations. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you said, so like I, you started a sentence that you finished a little bit differently than I thought when you said that um, 
what makes a text difficult or not and then you said it's not the grammar it's the uh, it's the vocabulary i almost thought you were going to say is how interested you are in the text <laughs> um because i think that that meta motivational factor is enormous if you care about what you're reading if you care about what oswald does next um right or what you know Egel does next and Egel or whatever you're gonna you're gonna learn uh, yes one I, I don't know how much time you have we've taken about an hour of your time i don't want to overstep bounds here oh no good um, to, good to stay on for a while but in the questions and chat over here so much positivity about oswald the bear <laughs> <laughs> um i was thinking if you wouldn't mind looking at it again maybe uh if people want to you know use their audio i don't think i don't think i block other people from using audio i think it's just not automatically on for other participants um if you want to just let show people what it's like to participate a little bit like, like yeah read have people read a little bit and, and answer questions you folks want to try that we can see how this works it may become uh it may become difficult if we have lots of people trying to do it, but I don't like why not? We may need a little bit of uh, traffic control, but uh, maybe one thing that might help. Um, Cameron here is one of the the students in in uh, in the the very class that does Oswald. So maybe Cameron, would you mind if we did a little bit of uh, back and forth? Oh, that's a good idea. Each thank you, each thank you, Cameron. Each thank you, I thank you. Yes, my friend. Each, each thank you, Each thank you, Each thank you, Cameron. And no, uton radon, uton radon. Cameron, will you for us radon? Viz Nedal, this part. Yes. Uh, on Engla Lande is some holt. On holte is some bera. What is on dam holte? Some bera is on holte. Se bera hate Oswald. Oswald is his name. Oswald wunath on holte. Wunath Oswald on huse? Nesa ne woneth he on husa ak on holte. Ah, well radest du Cameron, ich thank ye the. And and nu. Quar is Oswald? Oswald is on holte. Sodlice, sodlice. By the way, sodlice. Is a very very useful word in Old English. It means indeed, but it's used all over the place. Um, so it's a very all-purpose kind of expression. Sodlice, sodlice wunath Oswald ote. Sodlice is Oswald on holte. Well, sidest tu. Oswald is on holte. What is holt? Evne. Evne. Holt. Holt, uh, Hartindon, uh, Manier, uh, Bermas, Bermas, uh, on New English trees. Oswald is on Holte. On, uh, on Cameron, Wunoth Oswald on Hose? Nay, sir. Oswald, ne Wunoth on Hose, a con Holte. Ah, so riche. Ne Wunoth Oswald on Hose, a con Holte. Oh, well, answer this to. Well, answer this to. And I will say, as an aside, we get a lot for free as speakers of modern English. Mm -hmm. So I perhaps don't have to explain what answer this means. When you hear, it, after someone answers something, you hear, well, answer this to. This mm -hmm. is not the case with every ancient language. So sure. we, uh, we take our advantages where we find them. 
Um, sure, that's a that's a tougher lift with Hebrew. Certain or classical Chinese. This is my yeah. my white whale uh, because we have none of those exa- uh, advantages. Totally. Okay, ich bin dir, Cameron. Rad vor us fiznedal. Yes, sir. Hwa wunath os well bera he wunath on holte. Hwa wunath on holte. With oditli, with oditli wunath os well bera da. What is Oswald? Oswald is bearer. Is Oswald where? Nesa nis Oswald where? Is Oswald myeth? Nesa nis Oswald myeth. With Oditchle is Oswald bearer. Oswald is bearer and he wonneth on holte. Ah, each thank you, there, Cameron. And uh, Cameron, who wonneth on holte? Oswell Bera Wunathon Holte. Ah, oh, so liche. And is Oswald where? Nay, sir. Nis Oswald Nis where? Ak Bera. Ah, oh, so liche. Ak Cameron, is Oswald weef? Nay, sir. Oswald Nis weef. Ah, oh, his Bera. Nis he weef. Nisse where he is bearer, so the liche. And Cameron, where won at Oswald? Oswald won at on holte. Ah, so the liche, so the liche. Richte says to, right? Ah, this one. Richte says to. Richte says to. Rightly say you, or right you are. So liche, and it's thank you there. And shall we go for one more? Each bit de the, each bit de the, Cameron, please. Rad for us, this nedal. On engla lande is eak suntun, what hata setun, setun hata witan chiaster. Witanchiaster is his name. Wunath Oswald on Wintanchiastra Nesa ne Wunath Oswald bera on Wintanchiastra Tuna. He Wunath on Holte, na on Tuna. Hwa Wunath on wit- Wintanchiastra Sekuning. Sekuning Wunath on Wintanchiastra. Oh, well, Radis to each thank you, the. And, uh, and Cameron, on England is sum tun. Uh, what hate se tun? A se tun hate wintan chaster. Ah, so liche. Wintan chaster is his name. So liche. And uh, Cameron, wunath Oswald bera on wintan chaster? Ne se ne wunath Oswald on wintan chaster tun. Hmm. Mm. Where would not he? He would not on holte. So liche each thank you the. Ak ak sum where would not on winter chastre. Hwa. Se kuning se kuning would not on winter chastre. Ah, so liche. So liche se kuning. Yeze se kuning would not there. Richte seis du, richte seis du, Cameron. Ich danke dir. By the way, I have to compliment you on your amazing ability to draw with a mouse. <laughs> Ich danke dir, but it's not a mouse. It's a graphics tablet. This oh, is how. Oh, okay. If we'll it were, a, if it were a mouse, it would not look like this. Yeah, I was like, whoa. I mean, I I can't do that with a mouse. All right, uh, that makes sense. That makes sense. <laughs> Hey, I mean, good investment for what you're doing, because because the drawing is you're explaining what what's going on, and whatnot. And the is drawing, a really good touch. yeah, it really helps when, especially at the start, um, when we're still building up that basic vocabulary. And you know, as we go for uh, go longer, we just don't have time to be doing drawings because we're reading at such a good clip, and so much is happening. But uh, but yeah, it really does help. <laughs> no, I mean, Cameron, each thank you, thank you for being our guinea pig. No, that, no, it was fun. 
that's a that's a nice nice uh, demonstration. Well, I've really appreciated getting a look at this and and being able to uh, talk at in, in such a clear way about uh, the priorities and the methods that are being used at ALI to teach ancient languages like this. And uh, I really respect it. I really like it and uh, continue to be interested in this stuff. So um, I'll let you go here in a moment. Do we have other questions or remarks anybody wants to make? Um, if anything you would say about like the schedule of teaching Old English, like where, where are you at with that right now? Do people enroll at particular times during the year? Yeah, so it's uh, it works. Uh, we have sort of three terms, three academic terms at ALI. The uh, so one starts in September, uh, January, and then in uh, in uh, about May, May or June. Uh, so, so mirroring sort of, like, yeah, mirroring it's sort of a traditional three term academic year. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, so the next um, old, round of old English classes will be opening up for to begin in January. Um, Although if you want some some other, uh, some more Old English content, there will be some, so I have some on my YouTube channel, uh, which is going to be, well, we have some sort of easy texts explained on there. And mm -hmm. basically more and more is going to be coming out on there in terms of uh, comprehensible Old English. Nice. Okay. So you're, so you're also kind of... Uh... Well, you have a model a little bit like mine. You have a, you have some free material, and then also if people want to do the, the structured course, they they sign up. Although I don't have the structured course set up, but yeah, yeah it's nice. um, I want to get as much because we are starting so much farther behind with Old English uh, than with say Latin. There's, you know, the more that's out there in Old English that's pronounced um, reasonably well, we can't really uh, say for sure. You know, there are so many questions about how these things are pronounced, but at least a reasonable attempt, a consistent phonology, um, I think helps uh, with comprehensibility. So the more of that we can get out there, the better. Mm -hmm. And uh, like I said, I, I really think it's great. And uh, I've enjoyed having this chance to talk to you and see this demo and share it with Patreon. And um, I'll look forward to talking to you and the other ALI folks more in the near future mm -hmm. likewise really really happy that i had the chance to come on and say hi to everyone and say a little west through hall and uh yeah i hope uh this um has been somewhat helpful in sort of orienting how we think about um learning ancient languages and and to have an example perhaps in mind as to how it might be done oh very much so well thank you for your time west through hall my good man and uh well, everybody, thank you for coming, and I wish everybody all the best.